Let us pray. Our God in heaven, we thank you for your sustaining grace that whatever temptation, whatever persecution, whatever sorrow, whatever affliction, through it all, we can learn to trust in you. And we pray, O oh Lord, that as we have challenged us already, that the stirring that we have received, the inspiration that we have received, will carry us through in Jesus' name. Amen. That no matter what agents of Satan in this world may do, to try to discourage any of us, after laying our hands on the plow to look back, trying to send us away from the narrow path that leads to heaven, to go and depend upon the arms of the flesh, or try to relieve ourselves in unscriptural manner. Father, we pray that whatever it may be that will come, we'll learn to trust in you in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, for all the young people here, that if Jesus tarries, they still have long years ahead. We pray, O oh Lord, that whatever may happen along the way, they will trust you. Amen. We bless your name for our members in the choir as they have sung and they have helped us to take a decision that whatever happens, that through it all, we are going to trust the Lord. We pray for them too. That as they have ministered unto us, you minister to them. Amen. That they too will learn to trust the Lord. Amen. That the reality of the grace of God they have sung about will be in their very lives. Amen. We pray, o Lord, that in this session, once again, you will be with us. Amen. And help us to know that you are the all-sufficient one. And that you will never fail at a time of trial, at a time of persecution, at a time of need. In Jesus' name, we pray. We come in the study of our Beatitudes to the conclusion of the Beatitudes. As we have emphasized before, you have these Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3 to verse 12. And for us to remind ourselves of what we have learned before in the first three studies, I'll read through again as we concentrate on the last three verses of the Beatitudes today. Matthew chapter 5 from verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, they went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they with due hunger and thirst, after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice 
and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. To fully get the impact and the import of these passages we're going to study today, that is verses 10 to 12, concerning persecution and the reason there ought to be joy and blessing in persecution, we will need to see the connection between this beatitude on persecution and all that has gone before it in the beatitudes. If we overlook the connection and we take the persecution in isolation, we will not be able to see the beautiful link between everything and you may not be able to see the reason why you are persecuted. The wicked hate God's holy image and those who bear that holy image. They hate his truth and those who walk in the truth. The canal detest the spiritual as dogs snap at sheep. You remember we have learned about the poor in spirit. We have learned about day that morn. We have learned about the meek. We have learned about they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. We have learned about the merciful. We have learned about the pure in heart. And we have learned about the peacemakers. Now see the connection between all that and the, persecu and the persecution. The poor in spirit are persecuted by the proud in spirit. The haughty, egotistic religionists. The mourners in the kingdom are mocked and derided by the light-hearted and the frivolous. The meek are oppressed by aggressively possessive and covetous people. Those who thirst after righteousness are reviled by the power-hungry, the praise-thirsty, and the pleasure-mad throng. The merciful are slandered by the greedy. The pure in heart are falsely accused by sinners who feel condemned by their transparent lives. The peacemakers are insulted and assaulted by the children of Satan who desire neither peace with God nor peace with man. And so, the saints are persecuted by sinners. For what reason? For righteousness' sake. Then look at the Beatitudes again and start from verse 3. This time, looking at the blessing that these people in the Beatitudes have received. And once again, you will see the connection between these Beatitudes and the last, which is concerning persecution. Verse 3. This is the kingdom of heaven. These people have become the possessors of the kingdom. Verse 4. They shall be comforted. These people have become so united with the comforter that they receive constant consolation and comfort. In verse 5, they shall inherit the earth. What the people of the world are running after and they're not able to get, these people have been promised they are the rightful owners, not only of a part of the earth, but of the whole earth. In verse 6, they shall be filled, filled with righteousness, the very nature of God, the creator of the universe. In verse 7, they shall obtain mercy. And in verse 8, they shall see God. In verse 9, they shall be called the children of God. Connect all that with the persecution. That helps us to see the source and the reasons for our persecution. The possessors of the kingdom are persecuted by strangers to the kingdom. Those who receive divine comfort and consolation are hated by strangers and aliens to the comforter. Those who are promised the earth as an inheritance 
are oppressed by ambitious people who actually want to possess all things, but it's not going to be theirs. Those who are filled with righteousness are reviled by those who are filled with all unrighteousness. Those who obtain divine mercy are envied by the greedy who never seem to have enough. Those who are privileged to see God are falsely accused and persecuted by those who are separated from God. Those who by grace are called the children of God are insulted and assaulted by the children of Satan. So then you see the source of our persecution and the receipt for our persecution. It is all summed up very beautifully in Galatians chapter 4, verse 29. Galatians chapter 4, verse 29. But as then, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. So is it now. And so then, those of us who have become children of God, the subjects of the king, the citizens of the kingdom, will receive persecution because of the privilege we have which the people of the world have not been able to have. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5 again. From verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. As we look at these three verses, three points come out for study. Number one, the certainty of persecution. The certainty of persecution. You have in verses 10 and 11. It says, blessed are ye, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake all those who have become righteous in christ righteous by grace righteous by the submission of their hearts and life unto the lord there is a certainty that they will be persecuted and we're told of the very nature of the persecution it says in verse 11 blessed are ye when or in the greek whenever Men shall revile you. So this tells us examples of the persecution. Or they persecute you and say all manner of evil against you, falsely for my sake. So point one, the certainty of persecution. Point two, our conduct during persecution. Conduct through persecution. And you see there it says rejoice and be exceeding glad. And it tells us the reason why we ought to rejoice, because great is our reward in heaven. So we will learn how we need to conduct ourselves during persecution. Point three is blessing of the persecuted. Blessings for the persecuted. It says in verse 10, blessed are they which are persecuted. That's blessing. In verse 11, blessed are ye when men shall revile you. In verse 12, it says, great is your reward in heaven. In verse 10, again, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And in verse 12, it says, you join the company of the privileged people, so they persecuted the prophets that were before you. There's blessing for those who are being persecuted. Let's go back to point one, the certainty of persecution. The certainty of persecution. Jesus spoke about the fact that those who follow him will experience persecution. Paul the apostle spoke about it, that those who follow the Lord and live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. 
the apostles encouraged the elders in the churches that persecution will definitely come. And we're told in the epistles that we should not be surprised when persecution come, comes. In fact, it is part of our calling. Let's see some of these verses in John chapter 15. John chapter 15 from verse 18. If the world hates you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love its own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my sins, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. This tells us of the certainty of persecution. Jesus said it in various ways. In verse 18, he said, If the world hates you, you shouldn't be surprised. It is normal. It is to be expected because you are not of the world. It says if you are of the world, the world will love its own. But because you have been called out of the world, you are separated out of the world. You have given yourself to the Lord, the Master, and he now controls your life. And because they cannot have a way of controlling your life by their customs, by their tradition, by all the things they delight in. Because you have separated yourself from the world, you now say, you declare, I belong to the Lord. It says that is the reason they persecute you. Then Jesus said, you should remember that he himself, our Lord and Master, has been persecuted, and his servant will not be greater than his Lord. And you should be so happy that they are dealing with you the way they dealt with him. They recognize his nature in you, his life in you, his calling upon you. They recognize there is something in you that actually originated from Christ. And it is the reason for the enmity. It is the reason for the evil they try to do against you. He said all these things they will do, not because actually there is anything wrong with you, not because you are not living a life pleasing unto God. Not because God is angry with you. But because you have believed on his name. They will do it for his name's sake. And because they know not him that sent Christ our Lord. Let's move on to John chapter 16. From verse 3. These things have I spoken unto you that ye should not be offended. Jesus told the disciples about persecution. He said, if you do not know of the certainty of persecution, when it comes, you'll be offended. When it comes, you might be disturbed. When it comes, you might think, has God forsaken me? Am I no more a child of God? Is there something wrong with my life? Is God punishing me for the evil I did before I became born again? But I thought God has forgiven me. Or is it because of some mistakes I made after I became a Christian? But I've already confessed all that to the Lord. And since I saw the light, I saw that those things I shouldn't have said them, I shouldn't have done them. I thought I had the witness of the Spirit that I have been forgiven. You see that God has forgiven me, but he still wants me to pay for what has been forgiven. No, not at all. When he forgives, he forgets. And he says, all these things I tell you of the certainty of persecution, so that you will not have any wrong thought. You will not think that God is forsaking you. You will not think that you are being punished by what you did in the past. You will know you have been forgiven. All those sins have been forgotten. But... They will do it because they do not know your Lord. Then he tells us in verse 2, 
they shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh when whosoever killeth you will think he doeth God's service. Here Jesus said, some of the people that will persecute you will be religious people. The people that will think they're serving God. And they will think that persecuting you is part of their worship of God. Is part of what they need to do to show that they are really zealous for the Lord. It says in verse 3, These things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. It says in verse 2, they will profess to be religious. But then it says in verse 3, although they profess to be religious, if they are persecuting the children of God, if they are persecuting the possessors of the kingdom, if they are persecuting those who have received mercy from the Lord, if they are persecuting the pure in heart, if they are persecuting the peacemakers, they do it because they have neither known the Father nor me. In verse 33, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Then in Second Timothy chapter 3, Second Timothy chapter 3, looking at verse 12, the certainty of persecution, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. This tells us that even if it's a young Christian, a Christian that is a teenager, if he belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ, if he's living godly in Christ Jesus, he will suffer persecution. Or a Christian woman, if that Christian woman is living a godly life, she is going to suffer persecution. Or it may be a Christian man, if this man is preaching the gospel and living for the Lord, she is going to suffer persecution. Here is something that sometimes we don't reckon with. You look at your life and you see that you are really born again. And you are consecrated to the Lord. And as you are consecrated to the Lord, in fact, you are so happy. How you went on your knees, how you read the Bible, how you prayed, how you became so consecrated, how the witness of the Spirit came upon you. And then you say, this is the best time of my Christian life. In fact, I look back now. And I saw that the time I was born again, I was wonder, I'm, I'm wondering now, what kind of life was I living then? Because now things are bright, and by the grace of God, the holiness standard of God, it is now I understand holiness. And then you are surprised it is at that time when you are nearest to God. At that time, when you are deeply holy by the grace of God, that persecution comes. And then you are disturbed. You say, why? Because I didn't even experience this kind of uh, persecution when I was living a shallow life. I didn't have this persecution when my life was about just superficial. But now that I've gone deep into the Lord, I consecrated myself to the Lord. And by the grace of God, I can now say without any exaggeration, the holiness life of Christ has been translated into my life. It is then persecution will be real. Look at it again. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But here we thank God. Number one, it says all, which means there is no partiality. God does not shield some favorites away from persecution, and then some other people, he just, he just uh, tunnels and everything. Persecution is coming upon them. So none of us can say, well, you are lucky. I don't know what I've done. I've not discovered the secret yet. Why I am having persecution, but I see that you never have persecution. Maybe he's not having it today. Maybe he had it yesterday. 
And when you didn't have it yesterday, he was having it. As you have it today, he's not having it. And maybe tomorrow he's going to have it. And tomorrow you are going to be given some breathing space. All that shall live in Christ Jesus, live a godly life, shall suffer persecution. Here again is another thing we need to think about. There are times that we as preachers of the gospel, before you come to a conference like this, you've been preaching the word of God. You have been rejoicing and praising the Lord. And uh, of course, you have had a little share of persecution. As you have listened to all these anointed ministers of the gospel here, preaching to us, declaring the truth of the word of God to us, you have begun to discover your mistakes. The mistakes you made in the past. And then you say, oh yes, I realize now why I suffered some kind of trouble. I've discovered my mistake from that message. I discovered my mistake from that message. And now you put everything right. Now by the grace of God, all the emphasis the Holy Ghost has been bringing to us through his men, through his servants, you say everything now by the grace of God, I'm going to carry out. And then you go back. There's a new fire upon your life. A new zeal that we find in you. A, a new kind of holiness that is so deep and that is so bright. And a life that even people that, are, that look at you, if they are humble, if they are sincere, they will say, Pastor, we thank God for you. I think that one week you went for in that congress has done something we can never forget in your life. Then you relax and you say, praise the Lord. No more persecution now. Because, you know, here now I am holier than before I went to the Congress. And I put everything on the altar before I went to the Congress. And what will surprise you is that the holier you are, the more persecution you get. The more of Christ you get in you, the more persecution you get. And the more consecration you make, that you are going to do everything as it has been revealed to us in the Word of God, the more persecution you get. If you didn't know this truth, it will surprise you. You will say, maybe I am missing it somewhere. You are not missing it. You should be thanking God that you are close to Christ. And the closer you are to Christ, the greater hatred the devil will have for you. Now you tell me, which one is the devil going to hate more? The one that is saved, only saved, and living the normal Christian life? but doesn't have the ability to draw people away from Satan, or the one that is saved, sanctified, having the nature of Christ, and having the power of the Holy Ghost to tear down the kingdom of the devil. Well, the one that is saved and is going is saying, I praise the Lord, I'm born again, and I'm going to heaven, but I don't want to worry about any other person, although the devil will still persecute that individual, but the fellow that is tearing down the kingdom of the devil, the kingdom of darkness, you better believe there is going to be persecution. And if there is going to be persecution, then let's get ready for it. All will be persecuted. Well, you can rejoice that you are not an isolated fellow. It says, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now, when I look at that word all, that word helps me, and I believe it ought to help you. Because when I read in Revelation, I see that the Bible says there is a multitude of the people that came out of the world and they are now before the throne of God. And when you examine all those multitudes of people from every language and from every tribe, it says they have come out of the world, they followed the Lamb, and now they are in heaven. And then I look at this verse and I say every one of those people when they were on earth, they have been persecuted. Millions of people, multitudes of people. Well, if those people were able to overcome, and God moderated the persecution, that the persecution did not destroy them, and all those people have scaled through, and I am now going through it, I believe that we can overcome in Jesus' name. Because when you get to heaven, you'll find Christians that are teenagers, that are teenagers there, that is, those who became Christians at an age before 20, an age before 10. And all, they also have persecution. Those little children in the primary school who are born again, they have persecution. I'll show you now, later in the word of God, the kinds of persecution young people get. 
the kinds of persecution women get, the kind of persecution men get, the kind of persecution believers get, the kind of persecution elderly people get. All of us were persecution, but it's moderated to our age, to our experience. And if all those multitudes in the book of Revelation, if they go to heaven in spite of the persecution, you will get to heaven in spite of the opposition. In spite of what the devil might throw at you, God has given you grace. In fact, he's going to so moderate the affliction and the persecution and the opposition. It will never go beyond what you can bear. You can bear it. It is common to everybody. Yea, and all that will suffer, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Persecution then is a common experience of all who are true citizens of the heavenly kingdom. A Christian employee who refuses to violate his conscience often suffers at the hand of an ungodly employer. Say so you are not going to be dubious or fraudulent. You're not going to change that receipt. You're not going to tell a lie. As an employee, the employer who doesn't know the Lord will persecute you. It is common knowledge that Christian wives suffer persecution from ungodly husbands. Not because these Christian wives are not following the Bible, they are following the word of God. How many women have been beaten? How many women have been denied their rights? How many women have been denied normal, regular money they should have got from their husbands? How many women have suffered in one way or the other from the in-laws? How many women have been threatened because they are standing for their Christian faith? And then not only that, converted children often suffer persecution from godless parents. Those parents that do not know the Lord. There are times that you find these children that are born again, serving the Lord, they are persecuted by those ungodly parents, Christian students at school, often suffer for their faith before worldly-minded teachers. Those worldly-minded teachers may demand from those students things that are scriptural, or they may expect that those children will abandon Christ, abandon the word of God. And these children say, no, we rather obey God more than man. And these students, they suffer persecution. A converted family member often faces rejection and neglect by religious relatives. This is a family, maybe of ten people. And one isolated member of that family gives his life or life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you find the mother, the father, and all the other children persecuting that single individual. And sometimes it is because of an uncompromising Christian stand. And when you are uncompromising like that, maybe in your market, all the other people are contributing money to serve idol because of maybe making the market to sell very well. You say, no, I belong to the Lord. I don't want to do anything like that. You receive persecution, attack from ungodly people. Sometimes you are born again, and maybe before you knew this church, you are born again in another church, and you started reading the Bible. You became serious on the word of God. Then you may even find that the denominational preachers, they begin to persecute you. It may be that as you are even in a church like this now, you discover that other people, they will begin to speak against you because of holiness, because of your stand for the Bible. Even the people that say they believe in Christ, the people that say they are following the Lord, religious people, church-going people, preachers of this same Bible, it may be that they'll make fun of you, they'll revile you, they slander you, and things that are not true about you, they will say them. This is the normal thing for the people that are following the Lord. Should we count it strange? When persecution comes, let us look at First Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4, from verse 12. Beloved, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. 
Why shouldn't you count it as a strange thing? Oh, you don't count it as a strange thing because looking at the Bible, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into a burning, furry furnace. It's not strange. Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. It's not strange. David was slandered and hated without cause. It's not strange. Mordecai was scorned and conspired against. Persecution is not strange. Joseph was sold into slavery. Elijah was despised and threatened. Jeremiah was imprisoned in a slimy dungeon. John the Baptist was beheaded. Job was unjustly criticized and condemned. Moses was reviled again and again. Nehemiah was opposed and defamed. Disciples and apostles in the New Testament were persecuted and imprisoned. James was killed. Peter was martyred. John the Beloved was banished in exile. And the entire course of the life of Paul was one long series of bitter and relentless persecutions. That's why the Bible says it is not strange. Those who have believed on the Lord and those who have gone before us, they have been persecuted. And therefore, beloved, think it not strange. Think it not strange. Concerning the fairy trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. So then, we know that persecution is certain. And the reason we are persecuted is because we belong to the Lord. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 from verse 16. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Jesus Christ said, we are sheep. And is sending us forth into the midst of wolves. And wolves are never friendly with sheep. And therefore, there will be some inconveniences. There will be some threats against our lives. Against our convenience. But it says, be wise as serpents. Do not deliberately throw yourself into the jaws of the wolf. You see, there are some people that they know that persecution is normal. And they know that we're going to be rewarded if we're persecuted. Therefore, they will deliberately do things to annoy the unbelievers, to make those unbelievers to persecute them. They will talk in such a way and act in such a way, behave in such a way that these unbelievers will take notice of them and persecute them because they know that the more persecution they have, the more reward they are going to have. But Jesus said, you don't cause the persecution yourself. Be wise as serpents and be harmless as doves. That when those persecutions come, you are not going to be harmful. You are not going to say, I'm going to follow the rule and the law, the experience of self-preservation. I will defend myself. If they do this at me, I'm going to do this at them. No, you cannot do that as a Christian. It says you will have to be harmless as doves. In verse 17, but beware of men. For they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And ye shall be brought before the governors and the kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. Then it says in verse 24, The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master. And the servant as his Lord, if they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more they, how much more shall they call them of his household? Now Jesus has begun to tell us in these passages I've now read the nature of persecution, the forms, different forms that persecutions take, and persecution takes different forms. For different Christians in different communities. You see, in a place where you have the national religion 
as Christianity in quote. That's the kind of persecution that comes upon the believers. Take, for example, America is almost like, in quotes, a Christian country. There's no Christian country, but I said, almost like it looks like, because you know that there are many churches there. And you don't have Christian, any, any religion different from Christianity being major in uh, the United States of America. And yet, the real Christians, the real Christians still suffer persecution. But the persecution they suffer will be very, very different from the persecution a Christian in Mali will suffer. Because Mali is not majority Christian. It's not the majority of people in Mali that goes to church, that names the name of Christ. They belong to another religion in the majority. The kind of persecution you have over there then will be different from what you have in other places. Take Britain. Britain is a, like a secular state where only about 4% of the people go to church. Although they might have some Christian names, but really they do not really bother about Christ. And when you become a Christian and you're a child of God, a real, real Christian, there's a kind of persecution that you are going to receive. But understand, in a place like that, you have freedom, freedom of religion. Although individuals can insult you, individuals can abuse you, individuals can do anything, but there's freedom in a way. Well, that is going to be different from a person in another place, let's say, Benin Republic. Where in Benin Republic, you have as you line the streets with electric poles, also you line the streets with idols, idols that they worship. And there are millions of idols in all their villages and all their towns. And tradition is very strong. I mean, traditional religion. When you become a Christian in a place like Benin Republic, the kind of persecution you expect is totally different from the kind of persecution you are going to have in Britain. So as you move from place to place, the persecutions are going to be different. But whatever kind of persecution you have, depending upon where you are, upon where you are located, the Lord has got the grace to keep you and he will keep us in Jesus' name. Now, let us uh, change the picture a little. We have moved from country to country. Let us just stay in one country now and say, here is a little child, a boy of six, a boy of eight. And this child has given his life to the Lord Jesus Christ as uh, he plays with other children and the use of abusive language is going to say, no, I'm now for Jesus. I cannot use that kind of language. I am born again. And a child is going to say, you must be born again. Because if you are using abusive language like that, you are going to hell. Now, the other children are not going to imprison that child. They are going to throw that child in jail. Therefore, the kind of persecution that child is going to receive may just be that the other fellow will laugh may just be that that other child will go to call all the other children and they go to make fun with him. And when they want to play football, they are going to say, Jesus boy, you go, born again, you go. That may be all the persecution that child is going to have, but for that little child of age, it's very, very terrible that they isolate that child and may even cause tears and weeping and will come back home to daddy or to mommy and say that they are abusing me. They will not play with me because I belong to Jesus. Now you are 26 and not 6 years of age and you have just passed out of school, and you are working in a particular place, and where you are working, you come, you have your certificate, you are maybe a graduate or maybe whatever, and now you say, born again, exactly what that child says, you say. You say you are not going to be fraudulent, you are not going to do any evil, because you are a Christian, because you are born again. Well, in the office, they don't play football, so they are not going to say, you'll not play football with us. Your persecution is going to be different from that one of the little child. But the persecution of that little child is serious to that little child. Although it is not serious to you, that little child still needs the grace of God to overcome that persecution. But then in your place of work, 
like that. When you say, I declare for Jesus, I'm a child of God, you're also going to have persecution. The same persecution, if we use the same word, isolation for that child, isolation for you. Rejection for that child, rejection for you. But the rejection for you is different. That rejection can affect promotion. That rejection can affect what duty, what kind of thing they give you. The way they put your office and the place they locate your office. That rejection can affect the opportunities they give for you to go and study or for you to go and have this or that. Now take a preacher. It's not six years of age. It's not 26 years of age. It's a man of God. And this preacher, among all these other preachers, all the other preachers, they too, you know, they will make fun, they will jest, and they will talk about girls, and they will have this. And this one that says, I believe the Bible, he cannot do that with them. In fact, in their midst, his life will be a rebuke unto them. The same problem, the six years, uh, the child six years of age, isolation. The 26 years uh, of age uh, person that is working in office, isolation. This preacher of righteousness and holiness, among his other ministers, what do we find again? Isolation. But they're not going to say, we're not going to play football with you because those ministers don't play football. What they are going to say is not on football. What they are going to say is not going to be on whether you have promotion or you don't have promotion because you are not in the same denomination. What they are going to do is that in their ministerial association, your name will be discussed. Your name will be tossed around. Everybody is going to laugh about when they bring up your name and bring up the name of your local church. Everybody is going to have a kind of negative comment. Isolation, isolation, isolation. Now for the minister. Rejection for that boy. Rejection for this worker working in the office. Rejection for this minister working in the church. And so you find that it may be just the same thing, but it takes various forms for us. Therefore, no matter who we are, persecution will definitely come. But praise the Lord, Jesus has overcome the world for us. Now, the forms that persecution may take, and there will be no time to give you all the Bible references for this, but just listen. We may be despised and rejected of men. That's a form of persecution. We may be troubled and denied our rights. We may be cast out of synagogues or religious groups. We may be dishonored, oppressed, and afflicted. We may be retrenched, that is, rendered poor. We may be forsaken and ostracized, isolated from other people. We may be beaten and scourged or even stoned. We may be ridiculed, belittled, and constantly insulted. We may be slandered or we may be reviled. We may be despised and mocked. We may be hated and blackmailed. False accusations against us. We may be falsely accused and punished unjustly. We may be opposed and defamed. We may be betrayed and imprisoned. You see, these are forms of persecution that we find in the scriptures. And it happens to believers today at one level or the other. Not only that, persecution may take the form of the loss of privilege, the loss of business, the loss of employment, the loss of substance. Persecution may take the form of the loss of friends. That the friends will say, if you are going to carry that Bible too far, if you are going to be living like that, if every time we bring up a conversation concerning money, concerning women, you're, also, you're always going to be reminding us of repentance and judgment of God. If your kind of life is not a social life now, you can't drink with us, you can't smoke with us, you can't carry on in polygamy with us, you can't follow tradition, you can't do all the things that all the other people are doing, you're going to lose friends. And the loss of friends will be a form of persecution. In fact, some friends that were as your own soul, before you were born again, that that particular friend, if he didn't see you in a day, he will try to phone. If he can't get across on the phone, he will have to come to you, except he was sick, he will be there. Or maybe, before you were born again, you had a particular friend, I mean real close, intimate, tight friend. 
and this person, whatever, whatever you wanted in his house, you just went to that house and you took it, even when he wasn't there, you were that close. It's like you were of the same parent, and anything he wanted in your house, whenever you were not there, he just came, if he got there, your wife already knew how tight you are, how close you are. Uh, we'll say, uncle, what do you want? Or brother, what do you want? Because you are very, very close. And they just tell us so and so that I came. There's something we need to discuss together. If that person came at 11.30 in the night and the wife said, uncle came and said this, it will immediately, without eating, without sitting down, it's going to come. Now one of those intimate friends becomes a Christian. No more idol worship. And nothing evil to do together again. And this fellow, being his friend, he wanted him to get saved. And he said, see, my friend, something has happened to me. I'm now born again. I've got Jesus Christ in my heart. Life has now changed. All things have passed away. And this other fellow that has become so, part, so much part of him, like his right hand, like his right eye, like part of him, like his lungs, like his kidney, that he couldn't do without this individual, is going to be surprised that uncle is going to say, if that is so, you won't find me in your house again. Don't do like that. We've been close together. Don't let religion separate us, and it walks out of you. The pain, the agony, it is like if a doctor took a knife and without any kind of anesthetics to deaden any pain, he just cuts off your right hand like that. And you will feel the loss. It will appear somebody died. You will feel that something is missing. That somebody has left your life. Because you are so close, like so intimate as your own soul, like David and Jonathan. And here we are. That this person, because of your stand for Jesus Christ, will have to go like that. Yet, it is the loss of that friend that makes you to know how close Jesus is, the lover of your soul. It is the loss of that earthly friend that makes you to know how Jesus Christ tickets closer than a brother in adversity at all times. But it's a form of persecution. Sometimes persecution may take the form of isolation and bitter enmity, of open confrontation and cruel mockery. The people will just mock you and use some kind of language against you. And you will say, well, sir, am I so ugly like that? Is it true what these people are saying? Since I became a Christian, as Christianity so spoiled me that the language they are using at me, is it justified? Well, it is just the mockery which is a form of persecution. But all this is nothing. Now think about this. All this is nothing compared to the suffering and sorrow of sinners and backsliders and apostates in the great tribulation. Whatever persecution we have today, whatever difficulty or opposition we experience today, it is nothing to be compared with what will happen at the time of the great tribulation. It is nothing to be compared with the punishment of the condemned in the eternal lake of fire. So then, persecution will come. It is so certain there will be persecution. What is supposed to be the conduct of the believer during persecution? That leads us to point two. Conduct during persecution. In Matthew chapter 5, we're looking at it from verse 12. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. That tells us the attitude of the believer, the conduct of the believer during persecution. In fact, in another passage, it tells us to leap for joy. Not only that you rejoice, you literally shout for joy, jump for joy, because you know that your reward is great in heaven. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5. Acts, chapter 5, from verse 40 through to verse 42. And to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, 
rejoicing. That's our conduct. That's our attitude. Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple, they didn't stop preaching. And daily in every house, they ceased not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. Then in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16, verse 25. Acts 16, verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners had them. We don't stop coming to Bible study. We don't stop coming to the revival evangelism training service. We don't stop Sunday worship. We don't stop a workers' meeting on Saturday. We don't stop evangelism that we have pledged our lives to because of persecution. The more the persecutions are there, the more you still want to serve the Lord. In fact, Pete, uh, Paul and Silas were in the prison. And they had been beaten mercilessly. And yet, at midnight, they were singing praises unto the Lord. In Romans chapter 12, Verse 14, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Persecution shouldn't make us angry, shouldn't make us bitter. Persecution should not make us to have any negative attitude. Persecution should not make insulting language to come out of our mouth. Persecution should not lead us to the point that we abuse anybody. Persecution will not make us to fight or quarrel. Persecution will not make us to wish evil against anyone. In fact, the conduct we are to have in persecution is that we will bless the people that persecute us. We will bless and we will not curse. The temptation will be there to curse. The temptation will be there to get angry. The temptation will be there to get discouraged. The temptation will be there to lessen our praying for them. The temptation will be there to wish God will do something and bring them down and destroy them or punish them. The temptation will be there, but we shouldn't yield to that temptation. You bless and you pray for them. In Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, from verse 44, But I say unto you, love your enemies. And when Jesus said that, he has grace available for us to do it. And if you find that you're having difficulty loving your enemy, don't just say, well, I can't do it. Have more of Christ in you. The more you have Christ in you, the hope of glory, the more you will find the ability to be able to love your enemies. And pray that God will give you the grace that whatever those enemies do, whatever those persecutors do, you will love them so much, you will want them to get saved. Bless them that curse you. That's difficult. While they are heaping abuses upon you, raining curses upon you. Ordinary curses with maybe just words or serious curses with traditional medicine. While they are doing all that and you know about it, all you are doing is that you are blessing them. He says something negative concerning you. You say anything you know to be positive, you won't tell a lie. But anything you know to be positive about them, that is the only thing you will say. People come to you and they say, do you know that so and so is the one that is hindering your promotion in this place of work? Because he doesn't like you being a Christian. What are you going to do? Anytime you see something negative about him, are you going to write a secret letter to the board so that the board would also see that he's not a good man and they will not promote him to you? No, you cannot do that. He causes you, you bless him. Do good to them that hate you. The people that hate you. Sometimes you are living together in a particular house or a particular apartment. If you spread your clothes outside, they say it's the clothes of so-and-so Christian, let Jesus help him to remove it if it's going to rain. And everything that you have done, they turn it upside down. 
if you put your soup on the fire and you went to do something, if it is burning, they say, let Jesus look at it for him. They are not going to do anything about it. And then the soup is burnt, everything is upside down. If your child is not, uh, is not, is needs care and you are not there, if the child is crying like this or hurting himself, they say it's uh, the child of a Jesus woman. Let uh, her Jesus take care of the child. And you come back like this, the child has hurt herself. And say, ah, mama, so and so. This child was here. Eh? And so what? I don't, maybe you went to church. Where did you go? Maybe you had gone for evangelism. That's why I didn't, I didn't touch it. Because this Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And then the following day, something is happening to his child also. The devil is going to say, pay him back. Let the child hurt himself. But Christian, we cannot do that. You will do good. You will not say, because they did evil to me, and then you do evil to them. You do good to them that hate you, and you pray for them. Pray for them. That they spitefully use you and persecute you. Only then are we the children of our Father who is in heaven. Our persecution is only for righteousness' sake. We shouldn't be persecuted because we're doing anything evil. So we need to honestly ex examine ourselves before God to be sure that we are not suffering for our sins. We are not suffering for our foolishness. We are not suffering for our carelessness. What I mean, let me give you an example. You are living in a house. And you know that uh, Mr. So-and-so living in that house has got a second wife or third wife. And while the man was not around... You called the wife. This wife is not born again. You have not given Jesus to this woman. And you just call uh, the woman and you say, <laughs> you are second wife here in the house of Mr. So-and-so. If you don't pack your load before he comes back from the office this afternoon, you are going to hell. Jesus will come and you will perish. And the woman says, is that so? Ah, I'm telling you the fact. If you don't pack your load and go before the man comes back, you are going to hell. And the woman said, okay, I've heard. Immediately, the husband came back from office. He said, my husband, before you eat, sit down. Uh, you know, church madam told me something before you came. Said that I should pack my load from your house because I am second wife. Are you sure she said that? Uh -uh. You can go and ask her. And that man will not eat and say, ah, church madam, what happened? You want to kill me and you want to destroy my family? I didn't know you are the witch uh, here that is uh, troubling us. You want to scatter my family. What did you tell my, my wife? Is, is she's not your wife. Uh, when, I, when I went to her parents, were you there? I said this church madam will say, I said she's not your wife. Why did you say that? Huh? Because she's second wife. Preaching doctrine to somebody that is not born again. And that man will slap, that woman will fight and do all that and go to police station. And the woman will say, praise the Lord. I am suffering persecution. That one is not persecution. Well, God will not send you to hell because of that. But that is because you don't know how to preach. You are putting the cart before the horse. And because of that, we are suffering for our foolishness. Or there are times that as we, as we come here now, I spoke about uh, the idols in Bene Republic. And some of our brothers from Bene Republic are here. And they will say when we went to Lagos, they said that we should not worship idol. We're going to clean Kutonu. And then when they get there, before they take their Bibles and their booklets back to their houses, they begin to, in the streets, they begin to pack all those idols. Wham. And they break them. Wham. And they destroy them. And the idol worshippers say, what? What's the problem? No, idol is not good. Idol is going to stop in this uh, country this week. And before you know what, idol worshipping policemen will come and arrest them. And take them to prison. And then they write back to Nigeria, headquarters church, and say, we carried out what you told us. And after carrying it out, we are now in the prison. Let headquarters be praying for us. And send prayer requests to all our churches in Nigeria. Let them be praying for us. No, that is not persecution. We are suffering because of our foolishness. Uh, did Jesus Christ go to carry any idol from anywhere? 
Paul the apostle, when he went to Athens and Antioch and all those people, he saw a lot of idols. He said, as I went through your street, I saw many idols and even saw that you are worshipping the unknown God. Did Paul the apostle take those idols away from there, saying that he's serving God? That one is fanaticism. And so don't let us go back to our places and do something foolish and say that we are carrying out something. Then when we suffer for our foolishness, we say it is persecution. That one is not persecution. God will forgive you for your foolishness, but it is not persecution. And if there are people among us that have been doing things like that in the past, and we have been suffering as a result of our carelessness and foolishness, by the grace of God, everything will change in Jesus' name. So then, in times of persecution, we should rejoice. We should not be downcast. We should not be murmuring at the hostility of the people that we meet. We are to rejoice and be thankful to God. We must not knowingly, as I've said before, intentionally bring persecution upon ourselves. But once that persecution comes, we shall rejoice and leap for joy. And we must never, never, never plan to retaliate. Never. Retaliation must be cancelled from our mind, from our desires. We must never plan to retaliate. Never. Never defend yourself. Even in the church... You know, there are times that God works in wonderful ways. Somebody who had been persecuting you before has now become converted. As he became converted in that same church where you are, before, before when he was persecuting, you are just a new convert. And something God has done, something has rewarded you because of all that you suffered for his sake. Before that person became converted, you have become the pastor. And now this fellow is converted, child of God. But you remember, he that man persecuted you before. And God has sent him to the church where you are. And you are the pastor. And you are appointing people to be in charge of music, to be in charge of ushering, to be in charge of this, to be in charge of this. And this man says, my brother, my brother, <laughs> you say, my brother, all the persecution on you, you have not made restitution. All the word, everything that, because even though you didn't keep a diary, there's a diary inside your heart. All the word you said, this particular day, what you did that particular time, the other time, I know what I suffered from this man. He said he has been born again now. He has not made all the restitution to me. Then you will delay his water baptism. Why is this man not uh, baptized in water? He is not, he is not really born again. How do you know he has not finished his restitution? But we interviewed him. Yes, there is a particular restitution that I know. That if he has forgotten, Holy Ghost must remind him. Paul the apostle became converted. And he had thrown people into the prison. And then as he became converted, he came to join the people. Where is he going to start? From Peter to James to John to those apostles. Some of the people, he had scattered them. He cannot know where they are. Because in chapter 8, that Paul, that Saul then, he persecuted the people. The people were scattered abroad. And now if the apostles said, uh -huh, you are converted, the restitution is going to take you 10 years. All the places, Cyrene, Antioch, Cyprus, that the people are scattered to be making announcement and, uh, and be asking, how many people went to prison before because I persecuted him? How many women were persecuted before? Before that Paul will finish that, the rest of the people would have gone to heaven. But the church just forgave him. Why can't we forgive our persecutors in all the evil things they have done against us and just say that by the grace of God, this person is born again now, this person is converted now, let us forget the past and let us continue now as the children of God. Will there be blessing? Oh yes, wonderful, wonderful blessings. In Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 12. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Great is your reward in heaven. Our reward is great in heaven. And if you have suffered persecution before, I bless the name of the Lord for you. That that persecution has not destroyed you. That persecution is making you to grow stronger. 
and you will receive your reward in Jesus' name. Let me close with this familiar story, familiar to uh, many people in Nigeria here. may not be familiar to some of our brethren who are coming from outside Nigeria. It was at a time of serious persecution. And these Christians had been caught because of their Christian faith, 40 of them. The persecution was terrible. You know how you feel cold in this mild hamatan. And you have to put extra clothes on because you are feeling cold. But this time, they put these people in the pit of snow. Real serious cold, icy cold. And they wanted to freeze them to death. And they appointed soldiers over them. Soldiers with guns that if anybody tried to escape, they shoot him down. And it was very terrible for them. Intense persecution. And as the persecution was so intense like that, they were dying one by one. And one died, two, ten, twenty, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-five, thirty-six. You see, as we're all here together in fellowship, fellowship brings encouragement. If you want to, if you are a little bit lazy in prayer, you see your brother praying, it moves you to pray. If you are a little bit weak, you see your sister praying, it makes it moves you to pray. And so when the others, when they were 40, they were still standing, we will stand. By the grace of God, we will stand. Nothing will happen. Whatever these people are going to do, we are going to stand till the end. We know our reward is great in heaven. And then 39 died, remaining only one. This is a true story. And uh, this one single fellow that remained, he saw the bodies of all the other people. And the cold was terrible. And he knew that death was coming. Then he changed his mind. And disowned Christ. And then he said, soldiers, I now give up my faith. I give up my Christianity. The suffering is too much. I didn't know this is the way Christianity will be. One of the soldiers there, while those people were dying, had seen 40 crowns. 40 Christians, 40 crowns. As they were dying one by one, God opened the eyes, the spiritual eyes of that soldier. You know, sometimes God gives revelation to a Pharaoh or to a Nebuchadnezzar or to a, or to a pilot's wife. And so this revelation came to this man, to this soldier. As they were dying, they were being crowned. And the angels in heaven, uh, you saw them in, in, the, in the sky. They were rejoicing and taking them home one by one. And when this last one remained, the last crown was still waiting for him. When he said, I give up, the soldier said, come, I will take your place. And that soldier repented there, became a Christian, and suffered that persecution, and then got his crown. You are going back to your various places. You know, your various places where you go, the church will not be as large as this. Look at the encouragement we have together as we are together. We pray together, we eat together, we fellowship together. The encouragement, the fellowship is much. But when you go, Maybe you'll be the lonely Christian where you are. Remember, there's a crown waiting for you. Don't let a soldier take your crown. Don't let anyone take your crown. Hold fast till the end. The persecution will not be too much. God will give you grace to be able to bear it. Blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Great is your reward in heaven. If we do not have another congress before Jesus comes, make sure we meet at the feet of Jesus Christ. And I'll see you wearing your crown. I will know you didn't give up at a time of persecution. Let's rise up and pray.